from the CSI Today News Desk at the College of Staten Island. Welcome to the CSI Today Talks Podcast with your hosts, David Pizzuto and Terry Manns. The CSI Today Talks Podcast is your connection to the College of Staten Island with the newsmakers that make it happen. From world-renowned faculty and staff, dynamic students, and community leaders, stay connected to CSI with CSI Today Talks. And now, here is your host, Terry Mayers. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the CSI Today Talks podcast on CSIToday.com or from wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. This is Terry Mayers, co-host of CSI Today Talks, here to bring you the latest episode, Season 3, Episode 2. Today we're talking to Dean Balsamini, Director of the CSI Small Business Development Center. Before we get to Dean, we want to remind you to make sure that you subscribe to our podcast. Co-host David Pizzuto and I will look to bring you new episodes often. Like this episode coming up, all of our episodes are available via our archive on Anchor.fm, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, from our website at www.csitoday.com, or from wherever you found us today. So let's get right into it. Thanks for joining us today, Dean. How are you? Terry, thank you very much. My thanks to you, and a happy new year to you and the team, and a great year for CSI and the, and the whole Staten Island community. I hope so, Dean. Thank you. So why don't we start off by having you tell me a little bit about yourself, particularly your tenure at CSI. Okay, let me just give you a little bit of a background first. A uh, Brooklyn boy, a product of Catholic high schools and grammar schools and so forth and so on. You know, the whole routine from Brooklyn, married to my childhood sweetheart, Joanne, and two sons uh, who are grown, of course, now and, uh, and really doing that. Joanne passed, unfortunately, three years ago. So, Basically, I was a Brooklyn boy, and then until I got transferred to California, I was with AT&T in another life. Uh, and okay. so I actually uh, got transferred out to Cupertino, California, and uh, got to experience one thing that I wanted to do in my life, and that was get to Australia. Oh. I had a job that actually took me globally and primarily most of Asia Pacific in negotiations overseas got transferred back and did a variety of other things. So I had a great career with AT&T and then decided after my wife said, I think you want to go back and do something. I guess I really was not a real good golfer. So <laughs> what happened was uh, I did get a job actually with a not-for-profit. I ran SCORE on Staten Island for four years Okay. before coming to CSI in 2005. I was teaching some courses at CSI in marketing, seniors and what have you. Actually, Dr. Holock's courses, because she moved on to associate dean at the college at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a great experience. I got an opportunity, and then uh, ultimately the position was opened up for the director of the uh, Small Business Development Center. Initially, I decided I wasn't going to work full-time, and then they actually offered me the job. They asked me to actually submit on a search, and then I was selected, and that was it. I've been here since 2005, 17 years, at the SBDC. All right, great. Thank you. Let's shift now from your history to the Small Business Development Center's history. Uh, sure. Just give me a little bit of information about the background of the center. Well, the center itself is actually, this is a great topic, and by the way, because this year, we'll have 30 years at CSI. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. So actually, I wasn't here, of course, but it started in 1993. In fact, the whole center's development around New York State began in 1983, 10 years prior. We're all situated at a variety of colleges around New York State. So at CSI, it was it started in 1993, and I came here in uh, 2005. We're involved in quite a bit in the community. I think the biggest thing to remember that I look at, because I like demographics and I like, I like stats and what have you, the community of Staten Island is almost a half a million people. Mm -hmm. And we started out, when I first got over here, just working uh, for the Staten Island community, working with the community at large. 
And then uh, a little less than 10 years later, the congressperson was Vito Fasala, who's our current borough president. Okay. And I sent him a note, did some analysis, and I said, we're underserving your community. You're, you, at that time, it was a different district, the 13th congressional district. And I said, you know, w- you also serve constituents in Brooklyn. We need to serve that community. Sent them a letter, you know, gave them the analysis, and lo and behold, we did get the extra person to actually cover that area, and it's been that way since 2010. So we, we serve Staten Island, almost a half a million people, about another 300,000 in that community, which is now the 11th congressional district. But it gives us an opportunity to get flexibility and also serve veterans who are over in Brooklyn at Fort Hamilton and also... You know, we got Wadsworth here and, you know, we have uh, the Coast Guard. So there's a lot of impact on all elements of the community. And I think that's one of the great things that we, we want to do is respect the veteran community. And uh, many of our students are, are you know, are veterans. Mm-hmm. We began in 2005 when I started to look at opportunities. And uh, some of them came to us in a variety of ways. What do we really do? I think the best way to say it, we're a cost-effective way to create jobs, you know, grow the economy, enhance competitiveness, and not to be corny, but it's actually true, fulfill the American dream. Many people would like to be their own boss. Sure. Like to be their own entrepreneur. So the employee and staff I have are really talented people, full-time certified and trained business advisors, they have access to extensive business resources, both here and also uh, through our sources in Washington and in Albany. And we're part of a statewide network of 22 centers around the state, all of those located in a collegiate environment. They're all physically located at colleges, either at SUNY, at CUNY, and some of the private colleges in Manhattan, which include Columbia and Pace. Yeah, what I was just going to say is that in many cases, and this applies to all the centers, we have eight centers in New York City. You know, most people are not aware of the SBDC, and they'll tell you why. They get us confused with the SBA. They get us confused with SBS, which is Small Business Services. Mm -hmm. They get us confused with a lot of acronyms. So uh, that's why a lot of times I I like to contact our own people, uh, as you self believe here at the college. I, I know at times we've used the outside sign at the college, which is a great opportunity for people to find out about the resources that are available. Because they're there. They're free. They're actually, I hate the word free, that connotes, well, maybe not so good. <laughs> but there no no cost is really what I like to no, say. Well, not about. necessarily. Free is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, but that's what we do. And really, the mission really is a simple one. We like to look at it providing customized solutions through business advisement, education, research, and advocacy for entrepreneurs, innovators, and the SME community, the small, medium enterprise community. That's primarily our focus. And there's a lot of services that we do provide. Some of them fall in the line of business planning, writing assistance. Now, that may be a misnomer in some way. We don't actually write the business plan but we assist okay one of the things that i try to do in terms of when i was counseling myself was to sit down with the person who's interested has demonstrated they they want to start a business and i spend a little time maybe a half hour to an hour just trying to find out what and why why would you want to open up another pizza shop on staten island when we got 10 million of them, so to speak. <laughs> I'm kidding, but, you know, there's right. quite a few. And or another nail salon or and vice versa. And you get to see and understand what the dynamics are and what the people's interests are. And I think the more challenging things we're recently finding is more and more at-home businesses because people got the exposure through COVID to want to work from home and then, found out they could work from home and they could operate their own businesses. Mm -hmm. So that's where business planning comes into play, marketing, market research. We have a tremendous resource that's available to us. So let's say in this kind of situation, you wanted to open up a business 
and you want to get some information about competitive analysis or you know who are the competitors in that business going back to the pizza analogy but even more than that you might say well you know how do i know the site selection and all of this okay so we would do uh, and help out with the SWOT analysis which means to your, your strengths the weaknesses the opportunities and the threats for a type of business a lot of that is book knowledge that many of the students may have if they were coming to us mm -hmm. you know but other people who are seeking employment might not have and then we have a market research arm in Albany that would be dedicated to the marketing activities and needs of that client and we reach out to them and they all we all have master's degrees in in library science and whatever and they support our initiatives and support the centers around the city and then the others around the state there's a variety of other constituents minority women business enterprises one of the key things that I, I'd like to focus on quickly is disaster recovery when we found out with Superstorm Sandy and when that hit Staten Island with a vengeance one of the things that was key to us was okay how do we prevent this going forward after we were involved in many ways with uh, with clients and still got involved four or five years later that was over 10 years ago by mm -hmm. the way so yeah the, the big thing is we would say to our clients after that incident 2012 late 2012 you really need to consider putting to bed to uh, to your business plan when you develop it how do I handle any potential disasters not just hurricanes but what would happen if all of a sudden they decide to blow up the street in front of me and, you know, do all kinds of things and put in sewers. And now my business is hidden for several weeks, if not several months. What do I do? Uh -huh. It's things like that. We have a program called Entree Skills, which allows people to set up a business online. We work with them. We develop them. It's programmed. They can dedicate X amount of hours a month to it. And it takes them through the whole concept of a business plan taking it away from an academic exercise to a really an ability to be able to use it in your business planning uh, initiatives. Making it tangible. Quite, quite frankly, Terry, what will happen is if a person gets to that stage where they ultimately decide and they have the finances to be able to do it, a bank or any other lending institution wants to see, even if it's a thinned out version, what's your business plan mm -hmm. or the, what's your financials, that kind of thing. There's also uh, another aspect that, that you do is cost analysis and financial management. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, one of the things that cost analysis does, it provides us to really take a look at if it's a smaller business. And there's about 9,000 businesses on Staten Island, and most of those, 90% of those, 95% of those are small businesses, you know, mm -hmm. less than $2 million in terms of sales and those kinds of things. So it's very, very important for us to be of assistance. And we will work with them in, you know, analyzing a lot of aspects of their finances. Like, for example, someone comes to us and one of the things we would ask, and first of all, they signed a confidentiality agreement. We agree not to share any information with anyone else. And that's our commitment. Mm -hmm. It's part of our commitment and how we operate within the scope of supporting the SBA, but not the SBA. But one of the things that's important is to find out, like, how, what are your financial resources if you want to go into business and give them a real good, specific analysis of their needs. What's their credit score? I mean, if they come in with a very low credit score, automatically they can probably modify that, revamp that. But it may take them a year or two before they really could get back to even thinking about opening up a business. So we take it both ways. Also, it's not just for startups. We have had, and especially during COVID, we have had uh, some businesses that came to us that were totally financially strapped. Without the support they came in at that point in time through the PPP programs and idle loans and all of this, these people would have been under. And we had a few, unfortunately, that went under. Mm -hmm. But then we had a lot of success stories. And I think that's the key to this business. You know, most of us have been in business in another life, another situation. But the reason why we do it, primarily, the reason why I know why I do it in my team, is because you get tremendous satisfaction out of using your basic knowledge to help people succeed. And then that came in really loud and clear 
during you know during the COVID situation. Uh, yeah, that's one thing that I really wanted to focus on with you, Dean. Is uh, you did so many things for so many businesses during COVID. Uh, why don't you go a little bit more into detail on that? When you mentioned earlier, that's a key point that I really wanted to emphasize, and that had to do with the COVID response. In March of 2020, everything hit the fan, and businesses were uh, were really hurting dramatically. We were at the college. We put our disaster plan in motion. We actually left the college a week before the college went virtual. And we had a plan. We had a disaster plan, and that was that we would communicate with the seven members of my team. And the only way to do that, I set up a four o'clock call every day for us to communicate at the end of the day about what took place so that we'd be able to help each other. Okay. At first, I wasn't sure whether that would work, but it actually worked impeccably. We still do it today. But some of the things that you should know about in terms of our client base, we had on the normal times we had, let's say whatever was normal prior to COVID, we would have new clients coming in roughly around 500 or so cases a month. Mm -hmm. But we have a database of clients around 2,000 or so on an ongoing basis that remain clients of ours and we're back and forth and we communicate with them. That period of time, we had almost 3,000 clients 3,000 okay. clients. The place was quite frenetic. We had roughly 50-50 in terms of female and male clients. Okay. The results of that were unbelievable. We were able to save and create over 2,200 jobs. Fantastic. So what does that really mean? Well, the amount of loan investment in the community alone was over $50 million. And then job-related impact, in other words, the ability to actually cost save those jobs that we talked about were over 135 million so in effect 185 million dollars of total economic impact to the staten island and brooklyn communities were generated during that period of time which was unbelievable so if i were to say to you and you asked me say well dean how many clients have you been involved with over the years you know since 2005 is when we kept hardcore records here. Uh, we had almost 7,800, close to 8,000 clients. And ironically enough, Terry, 48%, it's almost 50-50 female. So I, I'm going to say 48%, but it's 48-52, but it, it's almost 50-50. And about 35% of them, over 2,000, are members of the underserved population. One last point, I think it's kind of a gee whiz thing for us anyway, is that we had over 92,000 counseling hours, which means that if we were an outside consultant, we basically would have had those as billable hours and saved almost 6,000 jobs since that period of time. So the numbers here became very, very important because we are metric driven. You know, the budgets are generated by Congress to the SBA, which is a cabinet level position, and they in turn set contracts up with SUNY and CUNY and the privates. So that's how we're funded. It's all about community orientation and what we do. And uh, we look at that, and I think the gratification comes in the businesses that we've dealt with. A couple of them were really, really hurting so badly. And I say couple, I'm talking about several. One of them is an Irish pub. I won't mention the name. Okay. But it was about to fail. We got a hot written letter by the owner who thanked one of my business advisors, Joe Muller, for all the work he did. And it was a tearjerker in some ways. He said, without Joe's help, he said, Joe, I, we wouldn't have been able to survive because we did get the loan information. We had no knowledge of what was available to us. We worked with you guys. You stayed with us. Uh, we had another bigger employee, employer, I should say, who was known on Staten Island, who once that hit, had virtually no business the next week. We had used them, involved in our consulting activity, and uh, they remarkably had cash flow for the next two years as a result of all the activity. And those are the kinds of things that make you really feel good. And then we've been working with a big outfit that everybody knows on Staten Island, 
And we were able to help them in the re- renovation process and procedure. They got certain economic awards and what have you, and uh, allowed them to continue, finish their projects and so forth. Yeah, so it does give you a great feel when you see, actually you do see the impact. And uh, several of my folks got uh, got major awards for client counseling. You know, I, I was fortunate enough to get the Lou Miller Award in 2021 from uh, the Chamber of Commerce. And by the way, working with the Chamber of Commerce, working with the Staten Island Economic Development Group, working with the Chamber in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, and, and uh, we're all community people. So that's the benefit. And, you know, you've been on Staten Island. You know what Staten Island's about. Sure. It's a, it's a community with a big heart. So we also work with a lot of the not-for-profits as well. And it gives us a footprint. And like I mentioned, Vito Fisella a while back. That was in 2010. Well, we still deal with him. He's now our borough president. He was a former congressman <laughs> at the time. So we, we really need to work with a lot of the officials, local officials as well. And uh, that's pretty much our story. Okay, Dean, another aspect is the center's involvement with the CSI incubator with high-tech right. startups. How are you involved there? Well, the nice part about this is that we're in the economic development group. We're all in the group together. And I work with, uh, with Jasmine Cardona's group uh, and uh, one of my people, a couple of them, but Joe Bottega in particular works with her uh, director there as well. And what we do is when they have new clients coming in or a new cohort, we'll be on the call with them. Okay. We'll evaluate them. We used to have a formal committee, but that's changed a bit. But when a new cohort comes in, it could be anywhere from four to eight people. We're there as well. Because while they're looking at the merits of them being a candidate for the program, we're also looking them at, at them as potential clients to maybe sharpen up some of the edges when perhaps they don't qualify immediately. Mm-hmm. But we could assist them with their business plan and other service needs that they may have. So it works hand in glove, and ultimately the plan is to have a new facility down on Bay Street, hopefully by the end of the year. So we're on point with them, and we work together very well. And that's really what I see as an opportunity for us to really provide differential services for the college, because the college has really, I, my opinion, a real need to demonstrate that it is a, it has a business school, but it also has the tools to be able to support that through what we do and also what, what's being done over in the incubator. Now, uh, you mentioned earlier when we first started about veteran services and assistance programs that the center offers. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm a proponent of really a former vet myself, not glamorous in any event. I just got recalled in one of the reserve calls up years ago, and I did my time. I was in a couple of years. But the bottom line, the state state side, but the bottom line with the veterans programs is a lot of the veterans, the younger veterans, once they leave the service and they've learned skill sets and what have you, they have a tendency to not want to participate in any of the veteran services that are available. So it makes it difficult. We have a center in Watertown, New York, which used to be Fort Drum and now Camp Drum, back, actually back to Fort Drum, where people come and go in terms of departures to different assignments and also yeah, we have a program that Albany provides, and we all provide it here, too, assisting them in developing post-service activity, mm-hmm. business activities, webinars. We try to stay current with them. We'll do some things uh, periodically. I haven't done anything this year, but over at Fort Hamilton, every two years, there's a changing of the guard. There's a lieutenant, there's a colonel, lieutenant colonel that runs the base. And we'll meet with them and discuss some of their needs and some of their training needs. So we stay, we try to stay as close as possible. And also the borough president's office has a veterans program. And we also have at CSI a person that handles some of the veterans with care contacts. So we try to stay current and make sure that we assess how many veterans that the college does have and try to do a program periodically on webinars. So to the point, I, I know that we're probably closed near the end of what are some of the things that are happening soon, and I have a couple of 
of things that I would want to mention as well, uh, like in real time happening in January. Why don't we talk a little bit about the Small Business Development Center's relationship with CSI students? Uh, how do students get involved and interface with the center, and what kind of programs do you have for them? Well, a couple of things. I want to start out at the high school level first and then migrate. We have a program on the board of the Chamber of Commerce, and we're on a, we do the what, he, what we call the A program, Young Entrepreneur Academy. Students are involved in, in contests to develop business plans and and what I do, my people will, will evaluate their business plan submittals in this contest. And then they, they ultimately go to Rochester for whoever wins the award from here. Or one of our students won it. Actually, this was from, uh, I think she was over from um, Staten Island Tech, won it about two years ago. Mm -hmm. and she got a tremendous award, a monetary award. But then... The migration strategy works this way. When students come to the college to look at CSI and what have you, we also give them an overview of what some of the, the ability to, for them to have business courses and business backgrounds. You know, we interface with the principals of the high schools as well, and we'll do some programs there. So we're familiar with those students when they think about CSI, and that's one of the things we help out in and do that too. And then we are here. We work with them in terms of some of the, the activities that's going on with the business school at the college. Okay. We have uh, an affiliation. I used to teach over there. So we have an affiliation with several of the professors. Agliotti is the person that runs the advertising program there, and we will get student interns. So that's one way we also work with the students and can utilize them. In fact, I'm going to be looking for one soon. So we have interfaces there, and I think that's what makes it pretty complete for us, is that we're a member of the Staten Island student community, too, in a lot of different ways. And uh, we will do presentations three or four times a year uh, to students during their uh, break at times, I guess on a Wednesday is when they normally do that. So, yeah, we, we definitely are engaged. We definitely are interested in the student population because they're the new geniuses, you know. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no Absolutely. It, you know, I mean, we know that and and the curiosity factor and everything else. So, and I like it because I, I was teaching a lot of these. I run into people that I taught, you know, even though it was for several years and maybe it wasn't a lot. I taught while, even while I was at the SBDC until we couldn't do it anymore after Superstorm Sandy. Mm -hmm. We just got too busy. Now, let's take a look at some of the upcoming events that uh, the Small Business Development Center will be having this spring semester. What's coming up? Sure. Well, a couple of things. One, actually, this month. One of the things that's so key, in my opinion, is that it's really getting to know about your finances. So we're doing, actually, a program on Thursday the 12th at 9 a.m. They go on our website. We can, you know, I'll give you the information, the contacts. It's called Demystifying Taxes for Small Business. And this isn't just for students, although once in a while I'll talk to our folks, uh, Cynthia Skarinski, who's over in the, uh, the business school. And as Cynthia, sometimes they'll bring their class when we're doing them in person. But we'll let them know and then have them bring a class. Now, obviously, it's not that time of the year yet. We have th three more weeks to go, but that's one area getting small businesses engaged and also students that are interested. Demystifying taxes. This is a basic course, a basic webinar. But the other one on January 25th, it's a tax webinar. We call it our tax forum. We've been doing it for the last 12 years. We get a tremendous turnout. Uh, and this is a tax forum for filing, business filing in 2023. It's at 9.30 a.m. Okay. And it's done by a Manhattan company called Edelman Katz in Manhattan. They're great. These, two, these CPAs are fantastic. One guy's a Staten Island native. So that's the nature of that. And then the other types of things that we have done in the past are uh, really involved in what's going on in the community, per se. Some of the topics du jour include you know, marketing activity, uh, how to market in a difficult situation, how to write a successful business plan. We do that every other month. Financial literacy, the 
key to actually getting involved. And this this one uh, we're doing on the 12th has a little bit of that cybersecurity, a very, very key operation. You know, we have a company on Staten Island called the Techie Geek, and they are uh, heavily engaged in cybersecurity. Businesses need to know about that, and so do we all, you know? Right. All right, so Dean, uh, just so that people can better connect with the center, can you give us the website where they can go to find out more about what's coming up with the center? Sure, Terry. They actually can reach us in a number of different ways. Email sbdc at csi.cuny.edu. Website to make an appointment, www.sisb dc.org slash make an appointment and then finally you know a couple of days a week Mondays and Wednesdays we're here at the college but our number here I'll give you the telephone number 718-982-2560 okay and we're in 3A105 all right and a final question for you what does the future hold for Small Business Development Center at CSI? Well, I think the center's got a longevity. We're 30 years here and at least 30 more. But I think the big challenge is really to be positioned as a go-to center for assistance for small businesses. And I think that's happening more and more. The more my folks are engaged in other types of activities, Ed Pisco, who's one of my folks mm-hmm. is involved with the uh, with the Knights, and he's also involved with the uh, business group on Staten Island. So is Joe Muller. So is Joe Bottega, who's involved with the bankers. He's a former banker. And that's the other part of it. I have people who have disciplines that either have financial background, former bankers, and most of my folks are, in fact, uh, fully certified, including myself. So it's great to be able to bring somebody uh, into the program. I just hired another woman, Bonnie Asiero, for my marketing activity to replace Megan Barron. And Bonnie's got a master's degree from Pace University and has a strong marketing background. Okay. So uh, we try to cover as much as we can, but I look at the center as being robust, but I also look at the Staten Island economy to come back Small businesses are hurting in a lot of the restaurants, mm-hmm. and only one area. But we, we deal primarily with retail. That's a lot of where our customers come from. So I think that's one of the challenges, but we'll hurdle that. This is a cycle, this whole inflation and economic up and downturn, and it comes back. Sure. So I'm positive about it. Well, Dean, I want to thank you for joining us today and letting our listeners know about the amazing things that the Small Business Development Center does to help our community and to help the economy here on Staten Island. Well, Terry, I want to thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate the work you guys have been doing over there now, and I definitely appreciate the fact that Staten Island is a community. It's a half a million people. And as I try to remind my good friends upstate, and I tease them, we're the largest city in New York State aside from New York City. Once in a while, I hear about Albany, Rochester, Buffalo, Syracuse. I'm sorry. I tell them I'm sorry, but we got it all here. Anyway, thank you so very much for your time. Thanks a lot, Dean. Take care. You too now. Have a good day. Bye now. Thanks again for listening. Coming up next week, David Pizzuto rejoins the show with an exclusive interview with CSI student Jackie Zhao on CSI Today Talks. Check us out, as well as all the newsmakers at CSI, on www.csitoday.com, and be sure to subscribe. We'll see you next week, right here on CSI Today Talks. Thank you for listening to this edition of the CSI Today Talks podcast. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to get alerted for brand new episodes and to listen on demand to your favorites. Be sure to check us out at www.csitoday.com or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast.